Koproducent TV seriála Interview 20. BH Telekom. Serious, yet approachable, charming but also modest, true diplomat, whose eyes reveal friendship as well. That is him, William Hague, Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. This wasn't his first visit to Bosnia and Herzegovina, and he's remarkably well informed about the situation, the issues, but also of the gratifying facts about our country. First and foremost, he's a politician with indubitable appreciation of opinions and time of each person he meets. He immaculately assesses spoken words, circumstances and opportunities. Decades spanning political career has taught him that. A career that started at a very early age. When he was barely 16, William Hague had a clear vision of what he wanted and how to deal with well-seasoned and experienced politicians. His early views earned him big rounds of applause. Even the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher herself, did not refrain from clapping to support the young Hague. And this is how it looked back then. There is at least one school, I think it's in London, where the pupils are allowed to win just one race each, uh, for fear that to win more would make the other pupils seem inferior. That is a classic illustration of the socialist state, which draws nearer with every Labour government and which Conservatives have never reversed. It's all right for some of you. Half of you won't be here in 30 or 40 years' time. <laughs> Although he was frequently seen in Margaret Thatcher's company, she was the one to veto the appointment of the 21-year-old Hague as a special advisor. William Hague did not seem too concerned with such turn of events. Always ready to face challenges, he marched on, with each of his steps pointed in the right direction. And here's what we know of him. William Hague was born on March 26, 1961, in the English Rotherham. He became known at the college for his noted passion for political dialogue, so it came as no surprise when he got elected as the chairman of the Oxford Union and the University Conservative Association. Following the British degree, he pursued further education at the French INSEAD Business School. William Hague is a conservative, a politician, a historian and an author. Writing is one of his great passions. He wrote two books, first one a biography of William Pitt the Junior, published in 2004, and him the prestigious award as the best historical book of the year. His next release was a biography of William Wilberforce, published in 2007. In May 2010, William Hague was appointed Secretary of the British Foreign Office and has remained in that position to date. He is extremely proud of his own part in drafting and passing of the Disability Discrimination Bill in 1995. He is also proud of creating the initiative for the prevention of sexual violence in conflict areas. This particular initiative that he created jointly with renowned movie star Angelina Jolie has brought him to Bosnia and Herzegovina this March. Although he made it to the interview set only minutes upon his arrival to Sarajevo, his face showed no signs of fatigue. He was smiling and in a good mood, exactly like a man who loves the country he just landed in. That's the way he is. William Hague. His visit to Bosnia and Herzegovina attracted immense local and international media attention. A segment of the Interview 20, aired on BHD1 that same evening, has been broadcasted, quoted or printed in dozens of electronic and printed media. In this exclusive special edition of the Interview 20, we give you the United Kingdom Foreign Secretary, William Hague. Dragi gledatelji, dobrodošli u specijalno vanredno izdanje emisije Interview 20. Iznimna mi je čast večeras predstaviti vam ministra vanjskih poslova Ujedinjenog kraljevstva, gospodina Viljama Hejga. Foreign Secretary Hejg, welcome to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. And welcome to program of television of Bosnia and Herzegovina and TV show Interview 20. It's a great pleasure to be on it. Thank you. 
First, let me start by asking about your situation in Ukraine. I know that you this week have a meeting in Hague, mm -hmm. foreign ministers meeting. You have information uh, from today about this meeting in the United Nations. Your comment? Well, there has been an important vote today in the United Nations General Assembly uh, about the situation in Ukraine, particularly in Crimea, calling for the territorial integrity of Ukraine to be respected. And that vote has been carried by 100 countries voting for it and only 11 voting against. So that is a, a 10 to 1 majority. It demonstrates the isolation of Russia in the world on this issue and that most of the countries in the world cannot support the, the violation of the independence and the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Now we are making every diplomatic effort possible to try to de-escalate this crisis. We continue to talk to Russia uh, about this, uh, but since we have not yet resolved it, uh, it's important to be clear that Russia cannot just take part in all international institutions and bodies. So at the G7 meeting in The Hague with President Obama and the other leaders of the world's largest economies, we decided that we will meet as the G7, not as the G8. Uh, Russia would have hosted the summit later this year, but this instead will be uh, the G7 working together in the world. And I think we will have to be ready for a different state of relations with Russia in the next few years than the relations we've had in the last 20 years. That is a pity, but we will have to be ready for that. And, and in that time, European countries, for instance, will reduce their dependence on energy supplies from Russia, and it will be a different relationship. Mm. So I must ask you, you said a few days ago that Ukraine crisis is the most serious test of European security in this century so far. What is the solution for Crimea? The solution is for Russia and Ukraine to talk to each other, to resolve these disputes peacefully, for everybody now to be to agree on a de-escalation. That means for Russia uh, not, th not having a, a threatening position towards Ukraine it means Russia joining the rest of us in trying to support the future of Ukraine and making sure that Ukraine can succeed economically. So there are these things that are a way forward, but it does need Russia and Ukraine to be talking to each other directly. And, and I welcome the fact that the foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine met uh, for the first time on Monday. I think we need to see more meetings between the Russian government and the Ukrainian government, and we are all ready to support that. Wide-ranging sanctions have been imposed by European Union and the United States. What more can European Union, United Kingdom, United States do? We can do a lot more if necessary. What? And, and this would be more far-reaching sanctions in the area of trade, of finance, uh, of the economy more generally than the sanctions that we've had so far. These sanctions are now in preparation. They are being prepared by the European Commission uh, with the participation of, of EU member states. Uh, and those sanctions are ready for if there is any further escalation by Russia of this crisis in Ukraine. Mm. Mr. Haig, who can remove Russian soldiers from Crimea? Well, clearly Russia doesn't have the intention of removing uh, soldiers from Crimea. Um, and so uh, they are clearly not proposing to do that. What we're looking at is a wider de-escalation of this crisis. And as I say, a different state of relations with Russia, if there is no solution to it. When diplomacy does not bring result, is it time for something else, for something new? I think we should always be open to efforts that are new, but we are trying every effort here. The UN Secretary General, of course, has been to Moscow and to Kiev. We've tried every diplomatic opportunity to find a way forward. In the absence of agreement with Russia about the future of Ukraine, then we must do what we can to support Ukraine, to try to make sure it can be a successful country, uh, not a country that is kept permanently weak by Russia. Um, and so we will do what we can with IMF support. Uh, Britain is already contributing to the technical 
capabilities of the Ukrainian government in, in financial management and these sorts of things where they really need expertise uh, from the rest of the world. And we look to them, the Ukrainian leaders, to end the culture of corruption that has existed in Ukraine, to make a fresh start politically, uh, to conduct their elections at the end of May in a way that is clearly fair to, to all concerned. So there, there are big responsibilities on the Ukrainian leaders as well as on the rest of us. This is very interesting. Swedish Foreign Minister Kaubild said that Crimea was just the Russian president's opening game. What do you think? Which game? Well, uh, it, um, clearly game, it's a, football game. It's, it's a <laughs> complex game? I don't know for Carl Bildt to define what sort of game uh, it is. It's very important that it is not followed up by further moves by Russia against Ukraine. Um, and that is why we are preparing other sanctions in the European Union, so is the United States. That is why the vote has taken place in the General Assembly that I was just talking about. But the world is making clear what it thinks. And even countries like China are abstaining at the United Nations, a country that usually nearly always votes with Russia on matters that are important for Russia, is abstaining. Moscow should be taking real notice of that. I must read something. Strop Talbot, former deputy U.S. secretary in the Clinton administration, said that Putin is already going further than just in Crimea. He said, now, that doesn't mean that he has actually formally moved in, annexed territory, had an overt invasion. So, Foreign Secretary Haig, who can forbid Russia to go invade more than just Crimea? Well, this is what we're talking about. This is why we are preparing additional measures in, in Washington and in Brussels. So that work is going on now. That's why we're trying to make sure the Ukrainian people have the opportunity to succeed uh, themselves. It's why we have supported the deployment of monitors from the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, and agreement has now been reached on monitors who will go in, including to the east and south of Ukraine, uh, so that we can all hear what is happening in that area and be aware of any provocation or any attempt from outside to destabilize uh, those parts of Ukraine. Uh, all of these things are designed to make clear to Russia the very serious diplomatic and economic price that would be paid from further intensifying this crisis and further moves against Ukraine. What message does the Crimea referendum send to other nations? It is very interesting for us in Bosnia-Herzegovina, your comment. Well, this is an illegitimate uh, referendum. This is clearly a, not a fair or legal or legitimate referendum. Uh, and, and that is very obvious from the presence of tens of thousands of troops, uh, a referendum that was held at a few days' notice with no campaigning by the other side, and uh, with the Ukrainian leaders having no access to that part of their country. It's not a referendum that can be respected anywhere in the world. Mm. But Putin ignored that, and the international law and constitution of Ukraine, everything. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, Russia has made the choice to ignore those considerations. But again, as we can see in the United Nations today, these things are not ignored by the rest of the world. And the reason that so many countries, the reason why 100 countries today have, have voted as they have, is because the rest of the world can see this is not a, this is not a democratic procedure. It is a mockery of democracy uh, by any of the standards of the democratic world. When discussing uh, sending possible messages to the others, we have our own local command here by the leader of the small entity of Republic Slovska. I'm sure that you know who is he. According to Mr. Dodik, the Crimea referendum is wholly leg legal and so are Russian actions. Please, your comment. Well, you can, as you can tell from everything else I've been saying, uh, these are not legal actions, first of all. Um, this is against the Charter of the United Nations. It is against all principles of international law, specifically against Russia's agreements with Ukraine, including the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, including the Black Sea Fleet Basing Memorandum, 
Russia has broken all of these things in its actions. So anyone who regards these actions as legal would have a very distorted view of the law. And clearly it is not democratic. Nobody uh, really who believes in democratic processes can think that a referendum held at the, um, at the barrel of a Kalashnikov uh, is a free and democratic expression of people's wishes. I will read you something Mura Dodik said, quote, we are looking at the same situation in the world. So what's happening in Italy? We see that Scotland will come quickly to a referendum. Something is happening in Catalonia. These are capital experience for Republic of Srpska. We will follow the example of the best international experience when the times come. So Foreign Secretary Haig, Miura Dodik, regularly mentions the secession of Republika Srpska from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And now, he said that smaller entity of Republic Srpska is similar to Scotland. So is this called Pickett case? <laughs> well, I Scot must ask you of this. Course. And Scotland, of course, is a is a great contrast with what has happened in Crimea. There we are having a referendum in September, on the 18th of September this year. That is a referendum held legally with the agreement of all parts of the United Kingdom. In fact, the law to allow that referendum to be held was passed in London. It is the British government uh, that has said that it is legal and, and has provided for a referendum in Scotland. Uh, so that is very, very different, of course, though the absolute opposite of what has happened in Crimea. Um, and I think what is important here in Bosnia, Herzegovina, is to recognize the importance of being able to function as a state. Uh, I am a very strong supporter of, of this country. I've always taken a great interest in this country and I believe in, in this country's ability to join its, its neighbors and to have a European future. This is what the, the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina need, this opportunity in the future. And so I am a strong supporter of future membership of the European Union and of NATO uh, for Bosnia. But this will only happen if Bosnia can function as a country. Uh, and to me, this means it is important that the map is finished uh, and that people are able to work together and efforts to try to dissolve uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina will be very strongly resisted by the United Kingdom and by much of the rest of the international community. Do you have some special message to Miradodic, maybe? Well, this is a message to everybody. This okay. is, this is okay. not a message to, to any one individual. Uh, it is a message of, of hope for the whole country. You have, friend, you have big friends in the world uh, who want to see you included in what all of us do. But it is also a warning uh, that political leaders in this country need to summon up the the leadership, uh, the ability, the, the political willpower to make the breakthroughs that are necessary in order for Bosnians to enjoy what people in Croatia and Serbia and Albania and all around the Balkans are going to be able to enjoy in the European Union and in NATO. Serbia very strongly support Russia and the referendum, Crimea referendum, so Serbia wants to go in the European Union. Is it a problem now? Well, as countries come towards membership of the European Union, uh, they of course are expected to work with the policies of the European Union. After all, we decide on many things together in the European Union. I go every month to the Foreign Affairs Council of the European Union and we agree our approach on many foreign policy issues together on Iran, on Syria, on Ukraine. And so for membership of the European Union, something that, that Serbia and other countries want uh, to be able to have, it is important to be able to work together on foreign policy issues. That will be part of the, of course, is part of what we are looking for in all of the countries of the Western Balkans over the coming years. Let's talk now about Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course. Uh, the Dayton Agreement ended the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but didn't provide a long-term solution for the country to progress and improve. So, 
is it time for United Kingdom, European Union, United States to be involved in creating positive changes here, Mr. Hake? Yes, I think it, it is very much time uh, for that. And we are involved in that. I was delighted to, to welcome to London last month um, many young leaders, maybe the future leaders of, of Bosnia, who came on a program funded by the British government uh, to study our democracy, uh, to see what happens in Britain, uh, to learn about our foreign policy. Uh, and so we always want to support and to discuss the future uh, with people who can really take on a, a leading role in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And I think it's important for us to support serious economic and social reforms for the European Union to be ready to do that. Baroness Ashton has been here recently saying exactly this. Um, and it's important for us all to encourage important issues to be resolved, issues that are blocking the progress of Bosnia towards the international community. Everybody knows what they are. They, they were Sadich Finci in the European Union, defense property in NATO. Um, and uh, it's, it's important for us all to encourage the resolution uh, of these things and for this country to be able to become a better functioning state so that its people have, as I say, the opportunity that other countries are going to have. Why should people in Bosnia be left behind uh, in what happens in the, the Balkans over the next decade? Okay, how do you read ideas made by some Bosnian crowd political leaders that now it's a time to make a third entity in Bosnia and Herzegovina? I think the important thing to concentrate on is making sure that Bosnia-Herzegovina works as a state, uh, that it is able to solve the issues that I've just been talking about. Uh, so no, my advice would be to concentrate on those things and on responding to the demand for economic and social reform. After all, there have been uh, protests here mm. in this country in recent weeks. What is your weeks. comment about this protest and demonstration in Bosnia-Herzegovina? Well, of course, uh, coming from another country, we must never regard ourselves as the expert uh, on these things. But I think it is understandable that people want to see economic and social change. They want to see political leadership. They want to see issues that we've just been discussing resolved. After all, this will af the ability to resolve such issues will affect decisively the opportunities for all the young people of this country. Uh, so it's understandable that people are unhappy at times with the progress that is being made. Uh, but I, I look forward to discussing on my visit with some of the people uh, who have, uh, some of the political leaders of course, okay. but also with people who've been involved in some of those uh, protests as to what they were, what they were trying to achieve. What is your opinion? Can protests really bring change here? The, the most important thing in a democratic country is for democracy to bring change and for political leaders to lead it. And when I say that I'm not um, lecturing the leaders of Bosnia, we have to do this in any country. It's all our responsibility in any country. In, in Britain in the last few years, we've had to change many things, particularly in our economy, and we're now succeeding in, in doing so. Um, this, this happens in every country. It's the, the political leaders who have the responsibility to, to work together, even when they come from differing points of view, to resolve the problems of the country and to open up opportunity for the people who live in that country. We've been doing it in a totally different way. We've been doing this in Britain in a coalition government. We've had two parties together in government that haven't been in government together since the Second World War. But we've made it work the last four years so that British businesses can succeed, so the British economy can recover. Now we have our unemployment falling faster than at any time in our history. Well, the, the young people of Bosnia deserve the same thing. They deserve to see falling unemployment and more opportunities in the future. So th this is, as in any country, it's down to the political leaders to do it. Mm -hmm. So, I must ask you, what is your message for political leaders in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Direct yeah, I, message. 
my message is what I've just been saying. <laughs> this huge responsibility that uh, rests on them uh, to make progress towards international institutions, to make sure that there is a properly functioning state, um, to make sure their country is not left out of what other countries are going to benefit from in, in future years. And it is their responsibility to make sure that these things happen. Do you have a message to citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina? Well, uh, the message I think to the citizens is, again, what I was saying a moment ago, you have some great friends in the world mm. and we will do a lot to help you and support you as we have done in many different ways over different years. And we're ready to do so again. But there are things that you have to do as well. Um, and therefore, use every democratic opportunity to push your country in the right direction. And you will find there are open arms in the rest of Europe to welcome you. I hope that it is possible here. So, uh, where do you see Bosnia and Herzegovina in a 10 years' time? Well, I would hope um, to see Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in the European Union, in NATO, uh, part of the transatlantic alliance, with people able to travel freely uh, around the rest of the European Union, able to pursue all the opportunities in, in education, in business, um, all the opportunities in life that come from that. That really should be the vision. And in these institutions, uh, with neighboring countries, um, because this, of course, is the best future for the whole of the Western Balkans in the future, not just for Bosnia, it's the best future for this entire region and it is the best solution to the very difficult past and the many tragic events of the past here. Mm -hmm. uh, will the European Union help Bosnia and Herzegovina move forward? Really? Yes, yes really? The, the European Union is certainly ready to help and you've seen in recent visits uh, from Commissioner Fula, from High Representative Ashton, uh, they have been setting out what the European Union can do to help. But I stress again, it's important for the for the conditions to be met. Uh, it's very important for this country to do what it needs to do and we will be ready to respond. Oh, UN Special Representative Angelina Jolie start an initiative on preventing sexual violence in the conflict. Could you tell us something about this please? Well this is a, a project that she and I started um, two years ago and in, in June this year we will hold a global summit involving 140 countries, including armies and judges from all over the world, to try to change the whole global attitude to this subject. Terrible things have happened in recent times, including here in Bosnia, uh, with tens of thousands of people raped in the conflicts of the 1990s. Terrible things have happened in many other countries in the world, in, in Colombia, in South America. Uh, or in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, in Africa and many other countries. Now this is not something that we can just accept in the world. We cannot say it is just okay that we are going to not worry if hundreds of thousands of people are systematically raped as a weapon of war and that hardly anyone is brought to justice for these crimes. This is not an act, we cannot accept a world in which that happens. And so we are trying to make sure the world is conscious of this, that we agree new international standards on the uh, investigation and documentation of these crimes, that more prosecutions take place, uh, that victims are properly supported and helped rather than being um, seen as people who have something wrong with them. Uh, and we're trying to bring the whole world together to address this. Bosnia has an important role to play. Yes, it is a very important story in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, is it true, Mr. Haig, that Bosnia and Herzegovina inspired you for this project? Yes, yes it is. Um, Tell me something about Well, that. <laughs> this is partly because of the... I was conscious from previous visits here of what 
happened here. And partly because Angelina Jolie made a very powerful um, film, uh, The Land of Blood and Honey. Uh, and I, that was why I met her. I agreed to show her film in the British Foreign Office. Um, and so I met her and I met the actors, um, who were Bosnian actors actually, who were, did a very good job in that film. And it, that film demonstrates the real horror of what happened and the need to do something about it. And so we have worked together ever since and we have visited some of the other countries that I have mentioned. But the fact that this can happen in Europe, in our lifetimes, demonstrates to all of us that this is not just some, it's not a far away yeah. problem. And people here know this better than anybody. Maybe our political leaders should learn from you and your initiative, Mr. Haig. Well, I will be discussing it with them uh, on this visit um, and inviting them to take part in the conference in June. Um, and I, I will be discussing this initiative with people from the, from the military here. Uh, Britain will be contributing to the, the training of peacekeepers, um, some of whom are trained here uh, in Bosnia. Um, and we'll be contributing to their training so that they are more conscious of the problems of sexual violence in conflict. So we will work together with, um, with many people in this country to learn from their experience, their knowledge, um, and their ideas about what we should do. Secretary, you are also a writer, am I right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you wrote about William Wilberforce mm -hmm. and the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. Are you William Haig, a man who will end rape in the war zones? Well, we shall see, but this will take much more than one man. Um, this will take men and women from all over the world to work together. So I am trying to demonstrate to a much wider number of people that we have to take action on this. Um, but I, one man, with one woman, Angelina Jolie, are trying to do the job of waking everybody up uh, to the need to tackle this problem. What is your opinion about Bosnia and Herzegovina? A country with immense opportunity and for which I feel a very deep friendship uh, personally and through my country. So let's make the most of the opportunity together. So finally, Foreign Secretary, I have one special question for you. Your staff tell me before this interview that I cannot ask that. Uh -huh. I will ask you. <laughs> I am very famous because I always ask what I want. So <laughs> you and Russian President Putin share the passion for judo. That is correct. Who is stronger? What is your opinion? Who is stronger, better in the ring? Well, President Putin Can you and imagine? I, haven't, we haven't <laughs> had the opportunity to test uh, this. And I think he did judo for a lot longer than I did. So you never know. What's I am not suggesting a, a, a bout of judo. Would you win? Would you win? <laughs> so well, I would try, but I'm not proposing it. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank your you. Time. It's a great pleasure. And happy birthday, Mr. Haig. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.